in the previous lecture we discussed about s parameters their properties and also the abcd parameters or the transmission parameters with this knowledge let us now take a look at some examples of the different rf and microwave networks which are commonly used so to start with to start with let us segregate those networks having the number of ports so first let us go for one port networks one port networks are networks obviously which have only one port not two ports so their z matrix y matrix s matrix will be just one element the s matrix will just be the reflection coefficient nothing else so for example they look something like this so these kind of networks are one port networks and examples are there standard loads like open load short load match load etc there can be loads which are inductive capacitive resistive with certain value so these are all are part of one port networks next is an example let's take a look at two port networks two port networks obviously we have looked at how to analyze two port networks and they look like this so examples include attenuators attenuators are networks which take an rf input and reduce their magnitude at the output so these are usually passive networks the opposite of attenuation is called amplification so amplifiers are the next example of two port networks but amplifiers are always active amplifiers are always active you cannot have amplification just by having passive devices so attenuators are basically lossy elements they use resistors inside to eat up some of the power of the signal and then whatever remains that is sent away so another example of a two port network is a filter you can have low pass filter high pass filter band pass filter usually most filters in the rf domain are passive although there are active filters too so out of these we will take a look at amplifiers in the later part of this course attenuators are quite simple they look something like this this is port 1 this is port 2 this is called a t attenuator because the resistance the resistor placement looks like a t you can also have another configuration which looks like this this is called as a pi attenuator because of the shape so the point is these resistor values can be designed to offer you matching at both ports and the actual attenuation that you want the signal to go through so therefore the analysis of such networks is not very difficult you can do that even using uh known network theory uh 
<coughs> examples. So, uh, all the knowledge you have gained in the network theory course, you can use them to analyze such kind of networks. As I mentioned, amplifiers are something we are going to take a look at, a close look at in the later part of the course. Filters is a vast subject and there are many examples of filters. Filters is one of the most widely researched areas among the microwave uh, field. And we shall not look at filters as part of this course. It deserves a better uh, handling of this topic as part of a separate course. Then we will come to three port networks. Examples of three port networks include power dividers, and combines. For example, you have a wave that comes in and it gets divided into two parts of each of reduced power that is called a power divider. Power combiner is something where you have two signals which are coming in and they get added up. Their powers get added up and that is called as a power combiner. So these are examples of three port networks. There are other examples also. But for example, circulators. Circulators are rather special devices. They are used to send the signal from one point to its most neighboring point, where the number of points or ports are multiple. We shall briefly discuss circulators also. Third is something called as T's. Now, T's are usually waveguides and as such, the topic of T's is extremely complex. So, we shall not look at this. We shall look at power dividers in some detail. These are usually passive. Circulators once upon a time used to be passive. They, many of them still are. And these days, you even have active circulators as well. Then come into four port networks. Example of a four port network is the simplest example is a directional coupler. So directional coupler does some very interesting things and what that is we will also take a look at. So these are some things which we will in fact investigate in the course, the part of the course that is remaining from now. So with this, let us go and try to look at the concept of power dividers and combiners. But before we directly jump into it, before we directly jump into it, let us try to understand some deeper information about three port networks. So in the previous lecture, we had said that whatever whatever we will analyze, whatever are the circuits and networks that we will analyze, we will test them with three criteria. The first is reciprocity, second is losslessness and third is matching, whether the network is matched. So therefore, I had in fact mentioned that it is not possible for a three port network to achieve all of these three at the same time. Let us see how. Now suppose I have a three port RF network, then its S matrix would look something like this.
So let's first put the condition for reciprocity. For reciprocity, that means the matrix must be symmetric. So therefore, this matrix would now become something like this. All these elements will be the same. So S21 will be equal to S12. So let's put S12 over here. S23. S31 will be equal to S13. S32 will be equal to S23. This is what a reciprocal three port S parameter matrix looks like. Now let's put the next condition which is easy to put that is matched condition. As you know the matched condition is when SII is equal to 0 for all the values of i from 1 to n. So that means all the diagonal elements will now become 0. So therefore the S matrix will now look like this. So all the diagonal elements are now 0. Now very easily we have achieved two of these. Very easily we have achieved two of these. Now comes the third and also very important criteria that is for losslessness. So let us now see whether the third criteria can be satisfied. So for losslessness we need we need the S matrix to obey the unitary property. So the product of the transpose and, its, and the conjugate of the original matrix must be equal to the identity matrix. So therefore, let us take this simplified matrix and put it over here. The transpose as we know is unchanged. symmetric matrix and the transpose sorry, sorry, the conjugate is something like this So therefore, this should be equal to the identity matrix which is nothing but this. So now let us, let us expand this. So the first row would give us S12 into S12 conjugate that is mod of S12 whole square. And this into this will give me mod of S13 whole square. The the second element over here, first row, but second column will be S13 into S23 conjugate. And the third row, sorry, just the first row and the third column will be S12 into S23 conjugate. Now I will only write the diagonal elements. Here what you will see is that the second row, second column, the diagonal element will be mod of S12 square plus mod of S23 square this into this plus this into this and here the third row third column diagonal element would be mod of s13 square plus mod of s23 square 
So the others would just be a kind of repetition of these two. So, but in either case, they are not very important. So what we want is this should be equal to the identity matrix. So therefore, by equating the elements, we will get the following equations. First of all, these two elements should be 0. That is S13 times S23 conjugate should be equal to 0 and S12 into S23 conjugate should be 0. This is one result. The next result is this next result is these three equations. These three equations should be equal to 1. So these are the results that we have. Now looking at the first two, this is equal to 0, this is equal to 0. So this would mean one easy way to satisfy is if we can just make S23 as 0. So if S23 conjugate is 0, then S23 has to be 0. Now if S23 is 0, what will happen is this will become 0, this will become 0. So Effectively, the mod of S12 and S13 would be 1. But then in that case, 1 plus 1 will never be equal to 1. 1 plus 1 would never be equal to 1. So this is never possible. So now, if S23 is not 0, then either, so then that means that for these both conditions to be satisfied, this can also be applied. S13 and S12 both are 0. But if these two are 0, then this equation again will not work. So therefore, this network can never ever be lossless. What did we do? We first applied the first two criteria, that is reciprocity and matching, and then investigated whether the network can be lossless or not. So what we saw is that if the network is reciprocal and matched, it can never be lossless. If the network is reciprocal and matched, it can never be lossless. So, so therefore, let us write that. So what we saw is if the network is reciprocal and matched, it will never be lossless. You can now prove that if the network is reciprocal and lossless, it will never be matched. And if the network is not reciprocal, it can be matched and lossless. So the networks which can be reciprocal and matched but they are lossy, such kind of networks are called as power dividers or combiners. These are only for three port. Now, if the network is reciprocal and lossless, but not matched, then these networks are called as T's, as I mentioned just a while back. And if a network is matched and lossless, but not reciprocal, then that is called as a circulator. So this is how 
we segregate three port networks based on their three different criteria based on the three different criteria so now with this knowledge armed in mind let us look at the concept of power dividers let us look at the concept of power dividers where in rf and microwave do we need power dividers or combiners well in the simplest form if you have one input over here and two ports over here you have some input over here and two outputs let's say port 1 port 2 and port 3 suppose there is some power over here p one of the easiest is if the power of this wave is p by 2 and p by 2 although you can also have power dividers where the division of the power is unequal you can have for example one place as p by 4 the other place it will have 3p by 4 so back to the original question where in rf and microwave domain or where would you feel that a power divider would be necessary so power divider would be necessary in many uh, communication networks let us say for example let us say for example i have a transmitter i have a transmitter which is wireless which has to transmit the signal power into some direction so if it is a mobile transmitter then it needs something called as a power amplifier or a PA. So power amplifier essentially has to blast the maximum amount of power it can to the antenna. Now what happens is that power amplifiers are very challenging circuits to work with. They are extremely power hungry devices. They are extremely power hungry circuits and often the amount of power that they handle it is difficult for a single amplifier to handle that amount of power. So therefore what may happen is that to sort of make the work a little easier, we have the signal which comes in, we divide it into two parts and then we have two amplifiers, PA1, PA2 and then again we combine it and then we send it to the antenna. So effectively the two amplifiers may be identical, non-identical, that's different. The point is that they are handling actually lesser amount of power but at the same time they are able to give the required gain. So this is nothing but a power divide and this is a power combiner. This is a power combiner. So this kind of a configuration was popularized many years back by an engineer and this kind of configuration for different applications is called as a Doherty amplifier. So this is one application where it is used the power dividers and combiners. You can also use power div dividers in local oscillators in homodyne receivers all of those work at very high frequencies so therefore let us see the different ways in which we can actually implement or design a power divider circuit so the first type of a power divider we call it as type 1 and that is the resistive power divider
the resistive power divider. As the word mentions resistive, as the word mentions resistive, it consists of resistors. So therefore, the moment we know that the circuit consists of resistor, it is lossy. It is a lossy network. So it looks something like this. This is port 1. Over here, we have port 2. And over here, we have port 3. So therefore, This is one way, this is the other way. So in the form of a star network, these are connected. So even the lower conductor would look something like this and then go over here. And here this comes all the way here. So it is assumed that at ports 1, 2 and 3, the feeding is done by some transmission line having characteristic impedance Z0. Now this looks like a very symmetric network. So therefore let us call all of these as R, R and R. Let's call these as R, R and R. So then let's start the analysis of this. Let us start the analysis of this. Now for the sake of convenience we will assume that the lower conductor that is the one which is moving from here all the way till here and also till here this is connected to ground we will assume that for the sake of simplicity and and then we will start the analysis so let us first try to see if port 1 can be matched. So this is port 1, this is R. Here also we have the ground. So we will assume, as I said, we will assume that the ground is there. So, let us say we now look over here at the input of the power divider or the input at port 1. So, let us call this as Z in, comma 1 which indicates Z in at port 1. So, what you see over here is that effectively the feed line has a characteristic impedance of Z0. So for port 1 to be matched, we need that Z in comma 1 should be this. This is needed for matching. Now, to get Z in 1 equal to Z0, what should be the condition for ports 2 and 3? So if I am measuring the impedance over here, S parameter theory tells me I must terminate ports 2 and 3 with matched impedances Z0. So therefore, Z in comma 1 will now be what? It will be this R and Z0 in series, this R and Z0 in series, the two are parallel to each other and in series with R. So therefore, the impedance at this point is effectively R plus Z0 by 2 plus this R and this is equal to Z in 1 and we need for matching that this quantity should be equal to Z0. So it is very, very easy now to find out what is the value of R. So therefore you can see that uh, 3R plus Z0 by 2 will be equal to Z0. So therefore, three R will be equal to two 
z0 minus z0 that is z0 so which means r has to be z0 by 3 r has to be z0 by 3 so therefore if each of these r values become z0 by 3 then port 1 will be matched you can also show that with this ports 2 and 3 will also be matched if you want to check the matching at port 2 you have to terminate ports 1 and 3 with z0 but there is no need to do that because this network is symmetric so if port 1 is matched even ports 2 and 3 will be matched so this is the beauty of a symmetric network or a network that is symmetric from all sides so now let us see what is the reflection coefficient or S11. So therefore S11 means what? S11 is nothing but the gamma looking at port 1 which is Z in comma 1 minus Z0 divided by Z in comma 1 plus Z0. So as we have proved that Z in 1 is nothing but Z0, so S11 will be equal to 0. That means it is perfectly matched and that is also equal to S22 and S33. So now let us try to find out what is let us try to find out what is the transmission coefficient or what is S21. That means if the input is at port 1 but the output is at port 2. So therefore this is like saying V2 minus divided by V1 plus given Vn plus is 0 where n is not equal to 1. So then what this means is that if my input is at port 1, let us now call it as z0 by 3, z0 by 3 and z0 by 3. So then this is port 1, this is port 2 and this is port 3. So what we need is all the ports except port 1 to be terminated by Z0. So therefore what we are looking at is this V1 plus and this is V2 minus. Well you can find this out very easily just by applying the circuit theorems or the potential divider formula. So if you assume that the length of this transmission line is very very less, then you will get this S21 is actually equal to So what is the if the voltage over here is V1 plus, what will be the voltage at this point? So Z0 by 3 plus Z0, that is 2Z0 by 3 in parallel with another 2Z0 by 3. So therefore, This will be using the potential divider formula whatever is the voltage over here let's call it as Vx it will be Vx times this divided by this plus this. This is how it is. Uh, so this plus this will not be 2 by 3 it will be 4 by 3 I'm sorry it will be 4 by 3. So 4 by 3 in parallel with 4 by 3 will give a 2 by 3. So this will be essentially 2 by 3 times z0 by z0 plus z0 by 3. So effectively this will be 
4 by 3. So all the z zeros will cancel. 2 by 3 into 1 by 4 by 3. So this will essentially be half. Now whether you are going from port 1 to port 2, port 1 to port 3 or port 3 to port 2, the s parameter will always be half. So therefore s12 equals s21, s13 equals s31 and s23 equals s31 and all of these are equal to half. So we know all the s parameters now. So the s parameters will be in the form of a matrix and that is 0, half, half, here is half, 0, half and half, half and 0. So what we can see immediately it, it is a reciprocal network, it is a match network but will this be lossless? Let's check. So S transpose into S conjugate would nothing but be, would be nothing but the same thing multiplied by itself. So if I take the halves common from both, we will get 1 by 4, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, multiplied by the same thing, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. So what we will get is 1 by 4 times 2, 1, 1. Yes. So as you can see, this is not equal to the identity matrix. So therefore, this is a lossy network. Obviously, we knew that it is lossy the moment we saw resistors in the circuit. We saw resistors in the circuit. So, what we saw was that in case of this power divider, if there is some voltage V over here, the voltage that is coming over here is essentially half of that or V by 2. So that means the power at port 2 is about V square by 4. So here the power is V square. Here also the power will be V square by 4. Now what this means is if my power of V square is entering the network then what is leading from ports 2 and 3? V square by 4 and V square by 4. So the total power entering is V square but the total power leading is V square by 4 plus V square by 4 which is V square by 2. That means the remaining of the power this minus the sum of these two that is V square by 2 that is getting lost or dissipated in these resistors. So that is a terrible, terrible thing. So therefore this is also called as a lossy power divider. Therefore this is called as a lossy power divider. So now the question is can we have a lossless power divider? Well, we can, but then as per the bound that is imposed on us, if we want something lossless, we have to give up either reciprocity or matching. We have to give up either reciprocity or matching. So this was a problem that many scientists faced sometime in the middle of the 20th century, especially during the Second World War. They had a lot of power for their radars and war equipment. But the question was, when they had to divide that power among different places, half of it was getting lost. So this was a big headache in the minds of the scientists that we anyways have the power but if half of it is getting lost while dividing, then there is just no point. 
can we have a network where if the input power is p the output should be p by 2 and p by 2 there is no loss well there is and at the same time it is not lossy in the true sense and at the same time it is matched also well how is this possible how can we have all the three things well there was a scientist who came very close to achieving this and we shall learn about the work of that scientist and his analysis to design that kind of a divider in the next lecture. Thank you.